markets became the default mechanism for an asset class, and people that wanted some juice from their assets gravitated to the equity markets. Uh, but if you're retired and, uh, you know, you don't want the risk, clearly if you can get 2 or 3% on your money uh, versus taking some risk in the stock market, you know, the short thing is, a very, is very compelling. So you do have folks taking money off the table. And then, of course, we have the, the perennial programs, which have hit in, and the downside's always more severe than the upside. They no, always go right down. about that. They How many of down. these have you and I talked about <laughs> that very subject, my friend? Let it, what do you look for in the near term? I know we're going to start getting earnings, bank earnings tomorrow. Right. They could probably, you know, help the market digest the good news that's yep. happening on that front. What do you think? Well, I think, yes. I mean, tomorrow we enter the third quarter earnings reporting period. Uh, full time with with the big money, some of the big money center banks. You know, hopefully, as in the past, we're going to get more good news and bad news from corporate America, and certainly that should help. But then, you know, right behind that, we have the midterm elections, which is another huge unknown, depending right. on how they go. So we've kind of got a one-two punch we have to deal with. The first one should be positive. The second one is a big question mark. Uh, so I think uh, it's going to be choppy waters probably for the next two or three weeks, but hopefully we'll get a positive tone out of the earnings period, which should carry us right into the midterm elections. We shall see. Ted, it's always a pleasure. we got to stop meeting like this when there's a crisis now, all right? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Be well, my friend. Ted Weisberg, uh, some perspective is everything here. Just be reminded by what Ronald Reagan was like right after stocks tumbled on that fateful day in 1987. Uh, he argued that stocks go up, stocks go down, that really there's uh, nothing more he could explain, just that he was optimistic about the fundamentals, the economy and the markets and America. He was proven right then. I suspect he'll be proven right now. Hello, everybody. I'm Jesse Waters, along with Jedediah Bila, Juan Williams, Dana Perino, and Greg Gutfeld. It's 5 o'clock in New York City, and this is The Five. It's the event everybody's talking about. Kanye West's America First sit down with President Trump at the White House. You know, they tried to scare me to not wear this hat, my own friends. But this hat, it gives me, it gives me power in a way. We're going to have more of Kanye in the West Wing ahead. But first, Democrats Hillary Clinton and Eric Holder are under fire for their recent comments attacking Republicans. You cannot be civil with a political party that wants to destroy what you stand for, what you care about. Michelle says that, you know, when they go low, we go high. No, no. When they go low, we kick them. And President Trump's responding to Holder. You better be careful what he's wishing for, that I can tell you. He's better be careful what he's wishing what do you for. Mean? That's a disgusting statement for him to make. For him to make a statement like that is a very dangerous statement. You know, they talk about us. We are exactly opposite. And Congressman Steve Scalise, who was shot by a deranged left-wing gunman, is calling out the left's mob mentality, writing, quote, if they want change, they need to convince people with their ideas and actually win elections, rather than call for violent resistance, harassment, and mob rule. Meanwhile, Holder's predictably backtracking, tweeting, quote, okay, stop the fake outrage. Mm -hmm. I'm obviously not advocating violence. In fact, when I was AG, violent crime in the U.S. was historically low. I'm saying Republicans are undermining our democracy and Democrats need to be tough, proud, and stand up for the values we believe in. The end. All right, Dana, one of the things that really works in politics is when you make your political opponents fight amongst each other. Oh, yeah. And that's what's happening right now. You have Michelle Obama, Hillary, Eric Holder, all fighting amongst each other, and that helps the right. You know who would not have apologized? Donald. Michael Avenetti. Oh, that's true. That's right? true. That's right? and, I, I, and I do think that there is something about the, for the wings, uh, especially on the left wing right now, wanting a fighter. Somebody's going to stand like, why would you apologize for that? Obviously, one, you could say he got a laugh out of the crowd. President Trump says lots of things get laughs from the crowd. And 
what does the left say? Like, oh, I can't believe you said that. It was terrible, right? <laughs> and now we're, the right is saying that about Eric Holder. Fake like, outrage. Oh, my God. Like, it's all about proportionality. I'm going to use that fake outrage line next time I say something That's controversial. Fake outrage. <laughs> right. But Avenatti would not have apologized. No, he wouldn't. He would have doubled down. Exactly. Greg, it's funny the Democrats debating on whether to take the high road. I don't think they've ever taken the high yeah. road. Accusing an innocent man of gang rape for about two <laughs> weeks is not exactly the high road. <laughs> and where does Scalise get off lecturing people about violence? <laughs> Violence. Yeah. Anyway, I will say this uh, before I get into my serious. I, I actually agree, believe what Holder is saying because I, I, I believe in the principle that you don't take the worst meaning or the worst intention of what somebody's saying. I don't believe he was inciting violence. Right. He was he was basically saying you have to fight harder. Having said that. Accusations of incivility, in my opinion, don't bug me at all. I think incivility is actually pretty good because it reduces the chance for violence. The more, if you're incivil with each other, uh, it might mean you might not punch. The thing that bothers me is the incitement and enabling of a mob. So when you have Netflix employees, yep. for example, uh, stalking Kilmeade in order for a show on Netflix and then inciting the passengers on the subway to join in in this orgy right. of persecution. What you have to look for is you have to look at people like that uh, because persecution is like this contagion. It's like when you're in a mob, it's spread through repetition and very e it can happen very easily. And I think we need to contrast words again and deeds. What Holder's saying is, uh, is words, but you got to look at the deeds. And I, people are comparing Donald Trump, you know, his words to left-wing deeds. I get it. Trump it can be rude. His jokes can be mean. But there's no right-wing Antifa or Occupy Wall Street. There's no right-wing Scalise shooting. There's no right-wing mobs chasing people out of restaurants or Broadway plays. And there's no right-wing Netflix employees because nobody who's right-wing works at Netflix. Yeah, right. So when Holder says something like this, I didn't think he was actually talking about literally kicking Republicans with his foot. I'm glad I, I, to hear that. I, I think <laughs> most people glad, think that. Glad, yeah. But what Greg's point is that in the context of all the other D that have gone on in the last week, month, year, where there's been violence and threats and things like that, it doesn't add anything to the conversation in a positive way. Oh, I think it does. I think both Dana and Greg said to you, Jesse, that what Democrats want are people who are going to stand up and fight for the Democratic brand. Right now, Republicans control the White House, the Congress, and the Supreme Court. And oftentimes they feel like, remember that uh, USA Today piece the president wrote this week? They think he gets away with saying things that are untrue and nobody's standing up and say, hey, this guy is misleading you, Republicans. Hey, where did you go, Republican Party? Come on back. Don't need to become Trumpian. But here's the thing. I'm listening to all you guys and I think, wait a second, what kind of one-sided presentation is this? This is the guy who was at rallies this week and he's got the crowd yelling, lock her up. Not about Hillary. It was Dianne Feinstein. Clever. This is... <laughs> Clever. It was a okay. nice transition. You want to give him credit, and, but at the same time, when Holder says Democrats need to stand up, oh, he's inside. I just think that's crazy. And but then, we of course, didn't say that. We've said no. that. That's and then you say there's no shooting. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Steve Scalise was terrible. That was an act of horror. But you got to admit. They went into a pizza parlor in Washington. The pizza parlor thing, though, is... Uh, I, yes. You, you've brought this up every day I bring day it up. Week. Okay, it's I'll bring up... How about Charlottesville? Well, wait, so Did they it? run over somebody in Charlottesville? Was, was that they, a right-wing mob? One mob? person, and they were nuts. Oh, I see. So, in other I words, you excuse it's a No, 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 no. no. I didn't... No, wait, wait, let me finish. It's, it, it, when it comes to Republicans, we got to be honest, it's a bug in the system. When it comes to the left, it's the system. You guys have had the Weather Underground, the SLA, the Black Panthers, the Manson family, Antifa. Will Republicans have nothing like uh, that. So you have white nationalists, you have a clan. Well, how about the and John Birch Society back who, then? Who are oh, fools. Okay. No, but I mean, that, you Jedediah, make excuses let, let's whenever it's on the road. It's not an excuse. Get, I hate them as much as you hate them. Jedediah, okay. what do you think? I, I, you know, it's interesting. You, you both gave Holder the benefit of the doubt, and that's great. I probably would too, but he wouldn't give you. If one of you <laughs> said that, you could that's forget true. it. He wouldn't have your back at all. I think this all started with the refusal to accept that Trump had won. And it started with that, and people on the left said, you know what, this was this was not a proper election. And they incited everybody to, to say that this election was not tangible and they should rally against. And it started with Maxine Waters. And I think the difference is these are leaders, these are many leaders now in the Democratic Party. You know, people talk to me all the time, oh, Tea Party rallies, you know, the signs they saw at Tea Party rallies. I don't want to hear about signs and have that, signs of people at a rally which, by the way, I never saw an offensive sign. I went to a million rallies and never saw one. I don't want to hear that compared to leader 
leaders in the Democratic Party, Holder, Hillary Clinton, who could have been president, coming out and saying outrageous things. And good on Michelle Obama, by the way, who came out and said, this is not acceptable what's going on. I'm sure Hillary Clinton was not happy with her, but I commend that because I think when something like this happens, it's, it's important for people within the party itself to stand up to it. So any Democrats that come out and stand up to this, I salute them as well. I wish the Republicans would stand for some of the outrageous things. That Many Hillary Republicans Clinton. criticize Donald Trump when he says something yeah. that is not appropriate. We are very willing to yeah. say oh, he I, shouldn't have tweeted that. I he shouldn't have it. said it. I, I wish Jared I wish the, the last, last two years. years. Yeah, I, I want to differentiate between what we're talking about, though. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to litigate political violence here, but, but Greg was bringing up a lot of examples, and I was yesterday, of left-wing attacks on Republican officials, cabinet members, yes. Trump family members, elected officials. There's been violence perpetrated by the right on the left in the streets, mm -hmm. and that's awful, and that's random, but when you're going after political leadership in a democracy that takes it to a higher level and I think that's the difference. What's what going after political leadership? Like Ryson, uh, Ryson, threats Wait a against second. family Wait a members, second. chasing them around in the streets. Jesse. How is that a different one What I'm saying is, is that that's an attack on a political leadership and not something, you know, driving into a car or shooting up a random pizza place. It's a, I'm not excusing that. I'm saying it's different categorically. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's different if someone stands up and says, Hey, I disagree with you. I think Mitch McConnell that what you did denying Merrick Garland, and I'm in this airport, and I'm going to let you hear it. That's not America. So that's harassing not somebody You're out okay of a with the Maxine Waters approach. What's Maxine saying? Chasing people through restaurants. Oh, no, that's she, she didn't say chasing. You are so dramatic. I, <laughs> all she said was, I'm a drama it's queen. okay to stand up I'm and a say, queen. "Hey, you be gender neutral." Right. She said, "Get anyway, in their face." Anyway, coming that's up, right. will right. Democrats smears against Kavanaugh sink them in the midterms? Trump's latest attacks next. And make sure to check us out. Action on the five. We'll be right back.
got so, so many, many people, people saying, saying, I wish you were running, running against BS and voting. You know, I'm not, not going to do it now because you're not running, running against it. Do me a favor. Do it. Just go out and vote. That's what I'm telling my rallies. Go out and vote. Because historically, whoever wins the presidency, you know better than anybody, they don't do well in midterms. I think this is different. The economy is the best it's ever been. Ever. Ever. Plus, Plus, I really, I really think, think that Justice, Justice Kavanaugh, the way he was, he was treated, treated so horribly, this is a fine man, man. what they, they did to him and his family, family the Democrats, I don't, I don't think people are going to forget that, that so quickly, but, but I, really I really think the Republicans are very energized, energized. Much, much more so, so now than, than two, two or three weeks ago. ago. We'll take, we'll take it around, around the table, table now, Greg. Um, some, some people suggest that the Brett balance, balance is really just a sugar, sugar high. high. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you know, know a lot about nutrition, about nutrition so, so I'm wondering... wondering. Do you think I, it was more like a protein a, meal? I think it's an analogy. I had another one. I felt like the Kavanaugh bounce is more like a, the charge on your smartphone. So every day, if you don't plug it in, you lose energy. And the goal of the Republicans is to keep that phone charged. And the only way you're going to keep that phone charged is with anger, which is what the, Dem the Democrats are doing, the same thing. They're relying on anger. But the, the problem with the Democrats, it's been the same anger for two years. The phone's already charged. So I don't know if you can add more charge to that phone. However, the Republicans, you know, they're, they're charged, but now it's going to, every day it's going to get a little bit less. So the Trump rallies are a way to plug that phone back in, mm -hmm. get that charge back up. I have now exhausted that analogy. Pretty good, though. <laughs> um, Jedediah, is it yeah. anger or um, uh, their eyes have been opened? I think it's a little bit of both, and I think it's the moderate Republicans that are actually enraged right now because some of those people that might have been True. inclined to stay home or weren't so now are seeing Democrats and saying, "Wow, this is this is beyond the pale." These are people who really don't play fair, and you know, they're, they're, a vast majority of the country does believe in presumption of innocence. There are so many people in this country that, regardless of their party lines, are saying that the way Kavanaugh was treated, not just by Democrats but by the media. It was horrific, and many people who maybe don't buy into that philosophy of, oh, the media hates conservatives or aren't, they're not part of that conservative, really hardcore base. They're sitting back and saying, maybe they do have a point because they watched what this guy was put through and how he was painted, and, it, and they were completely appalled by it. So I think a lot of those people that may not have been pushed to vote are now saying, wait a minute, these Democrats are really went off the rails, and now I have to get out there because I'm fighting for basic tenets of, of our republic. Juan, Senate Democrats that were running in red states for re-election, they already had tough races, and now it looks like the Republicans even pulling ahead in Nevada um, and certainly in Tennessee. Right. So, uh, and Bridgerton in Tennessee, obviously now down bigger than he ever was yeah. uh, to Marsha Blackburn. Uh, and in some states you see, especially states that were purplish to red because it's energized the Republican votes there. But if you contrast that with what's going on on the House level, it may have had a flip reaction, especially in terms right. of women and suburban white women in particular. But overall, I think this emphasis from Republicans and the president on Kavanaugh is because, the, guess what? They haven't found something that works with voters for the midterm. So clearly they had hoped the tax cut would work, but it didn't work. They'd hoped the economy, the president even referenced that on Fox and Friends today. And again, most Americans don't think that the economy is a topic to vote on. The president had an op-ed that we talked about a moment ago in USA Today this week. It was on, guess what topic? Health care. Mm -hmm. But again, that's the number one topic in these midterms, health care. And he's trying to position himself as not undercutting mm -hmm. Obamacare or Medicare. But again, he's scaring people, and I'm Jesse, not sure he's telling the truth. Is it just about Brett Kavanaugh and the Supreme Court, or is it um, the Republicans deciding we've got to get behind, or we've got to unite and get behind President Trump, or else the left is going to do to us what they did to Brett Kavanaugh? It's funny that you mentioned that, Dana. There's a great piece in The Federalist today, which I was reading earlier. How <laughs> Kavanaugh's confirmation finally united the right under Trump by Brad Todd, two first names. How do you feel about that? I'm against that. Okay, so, you know, read this at your own risk. And it, and it goes to what Jedediah was saying, that some of these maybe moderate Republicans that weren't super jazzed about Trumpism have now really coalesced behind them. And to Juan's point, I don't think that the economy or the tax cut wasn't working and they were flailing around looking for other things. I think you build on success and the Kavanaugh confirmation was just another successful point. But the Democrats can't get out of their own way. They stepped into a hornet's nest and instead of running away, they're lingering around and they keep getting stung. They keep talking about the definition of a mob. They keep talking about impeachment and they can't let the Kavanaugh thing go when they should pivot and talk about health care or college costs or Mueller or whatever they need to do. Don't help them out. 
mouth. I, I mean, they're Don't probably not taking advice from me, but I think the point is, is that it wasn't just the Kavanaugh confirmation that fired up the right. I think it was watching the hysterical, desperate behavior of some of these left-wing activists. Their antics turned people off, and it showed average voters. It kind of gave them a window into the soul of the Democratic Party. This is how crazy these people are. And if you think about it, they're this crazy now. Yes. Imagine if they don't retake the House. Yeah. Oh, I'm man. buying a bunker. Well, really? <laughs> I, I think I'd have to go to a Trump rally to see they how they'll, crazy they'll people blame, can uh, let's see. They can't blame the Electoral College for that. They'll blame gerrymandering. I think. Yeah, uh, that's what yeah, I hate that person. guy. <laughs> yeah. He actually was a guy. Was he? Yes, yes, he was. I'll tell you about it later. Kanye no, West. tell me now. Tell me now. America First policies during their free-flowing Oval Office meeting. But first, Melania Trump responds to social media attacks. That's ahead on the five. Does it need Jerry? Man? Hi, I'm William Devane. The future of our country is hanging in the balance, which is why, as a good American, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to vote, and I'm going to buy...
First Lady Melania Trump with some stunning revelations about the president's inner circle at the White House. He's been in office now almost two years. Has he had people that you didn't trust working for him? Yes. Did you let him know? I let him know. And what did he do? Well, some people, they don't work there anymore. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Mrs. Trump also pushing back against social media attacks that she said inspired her to launch her Be Best campaign. I could say I'm the most bullied person on, on the world. You think you're the most bullied person in the world? Well, one of them. If you really see what people are saying about me, that's why I, you know, my Be Best initiative is focusing on um, social media and online behavior. Jedediah, boy, she's the most bullied person in the world, I mean, or she, one of them? She does get bullied a lot. I've oh. seen her bullied for her accent. You, everybody has to, you know, the first thing they look at is whether she's wearing an appropriate outfit all the time. She just got, she got bullied for that hat that she had on. Before that, it was the jacket, you know? So I think, she, I think that's fair. I mean, I think every first lady, to be fair, gets bullied, you know, to a certain degree. Michelle Obama certainly took a lot of heat as well. But why is it controversial for her to say that? If, if Michelle Obama had come out and said, listen, I get bullied a lot from, you know, folks on the right, everybody would have said, yeah, that's probably true. But because she said it, I saw all over Twitter from people on the left, they were critiquing her and saying, well, how dare she say that? I think she takes a lot of heat. And well, she's I think right. she takes criticism. I think that's different than being bullied, but I hear your point. Well, if it's the, about an the outfit good or about her, her campaign uh, to focus on social media bullying is that if you are attacked on social media, you think you are the most bullied person in the world. It doesn't matter if it's like 10 people or something. It's all perception. Right. And that's why she's trying to encourage everybody to just be nice. The one thing about this that maybe tomorrow night on 2020 we'll see something different is that she went to Africa. She was representing the United States. She was saying that we care about you and the human condition. She met with children. She took books. Mm -hmm. She went and saw the elephants, which are in danger. I mean, she did a lot of things that rather than just having to worry about who's in the West Wing. Maybe they asked her about it. We'll see you tomorrow night. But, and, and Jesse, she also said that she supports women being heard. She'd prefer if they have evidence, but she wants the idea. Of women. So this fits with the fact that I think it's the plurality of Americans believe Professor Ford. But, you know, uh, what do you well, think I of her saying? I wouldn't take what you said to be what she said. I, she certainly has a flair for the dramatic, like her husband. I mean, she goes over there with some really dashing outfits and then does this network interview and stokes palace intrigue and says she's the one that's being bullied and flips the whole script on the media. And I agree with Jedediah. I mean, from the shoes yeah, and she can't win, the no jacket. And to remember when she was recovering from surgery and then they were stoking all these rumors about something scandalous yep. going on and you know for probably the most beautiful and, and glamorous and exotic first lady America has ever had she does not get treated the way other first ladies had she does not get these glossy magazine spreads she does not get these kind of beautiful puff piece interviews the way Hillary did or Michelle Obama and she showed she still got juice in the White House there was that one moment when, you know, when you tell your husband about these people that are backstabbing, what happens? Well, they're not there anymore. <laughs> so she yeah. does have influence, and I think she wields it uh, really responsibly. So, Greg, you picked up from our friends here. There's a lot of talk about how she was dressed in Africa, specifically mm -hmm. that pith helmet that some yes. people said reminded them of uh, colonial days in Africa. Um, and a contrast to uh, I don't care, the stuff she wore in the back of a jacket. Some people say, oh, well, you, you know what? Fashion does send a message. Is that fair? Um, I think it's just, you know, we're fairly superficial people. Uh, if you ask any uh, journalist in, at the, uh, who is involved in the entertainment world, they'd much rather write about her hat than yes. any kind of issues. So it's just an easy hook. Um, I think that she, you know, I, I don't think anybody's taken this kind of heat. I, I, I would disagree on that. I don't think Michelle Obama got, got even a, a smidgen of the kind of abuse she gets. And I do think her predicament has made her isolated. She is one of a kind. She wasn't born here. She came here. Uh, if, I, I've said this before. If my spouse became president of Ukraine and I moved to the Ukraine as the first man, I don't think I could handle this situation with one uh -oh. iota of how she... We would I would be analyzing am, your shoes I would and be, your jacket. Your I would be suspicious of everyone. I would never leave the house. I'd be ordering pizzas. <laughs> I would have a test 
taster of the pizzas. So I think she's like, she's definitely the best first lady since Mary Todd Lincoln. Don't you stay in and order food now? Yes, in, just in, case, in case somebody from the Ukraine is looking for me. I know I couldn't find you last night. <laughs> Kanye, Kanye praising the president, Greg's monologue, and the musty moments from the West Wing love affair. Oh boy, up next. So, Kanye went to the White House. I wonder if they tried to scare him into not wearing his hat. You know, they tried to scare me to not wear this hat, my own friends. But this hat, it gives me, it gives me power in a way. I love Hillary. I love everyone, right? But the campaign, I'm with her.
just didn't make me feel as a guy that didn't get to see my dad all the time, like a guy that could play catch with his son. It was something about when I put this hat on, it made me feel like Superman. You made a Superman. That was, that's my favorite superhero. And you made a Superman cake for me. Mm. And when the president doesn't look good, America doesn't look good. If he don't look good, we don't look good. This is our president. He has to be the freshest, the flyest, the flyest planes, the best factories. And we have to make our core be in power. We have to bring jobs into America. And we're putting people in positions to have to do illegal things to end up in the cheapest factory ever, the, uh, the prison system. I'll tell you what, that was pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty impressive because all we really have is today. All we really have is today. We just have today, over and over and over again, the eternal return, the hero's journey. And Trump is on his hero's journey right now. And he might not have expected to have a crazy <laughs> like Kanye West run up and uh, support. But best believe, we are going to make America great. So just another day in Trump world. <laughs> this really is a new frontier, full of incredible allies and surreal surprises. After being told it was going to be the apocalypse, we have a booming economy, ridiculously low unemployment, a new justice, no big, ugly wars, progress in trade, and peace is breaking out among the Koreas. And now you have the world's biggest male pop star going to the White House to discuss big issues and getting what seems to be a real concession. You'd think he would receive media complain, uh, acclaim for trying. You'd be wrong. That but was if you think you're bonkers. going to get uh, uh, a thoughtful play-by-play -play and political analysis, you're not. Because that was an assault on our White House. That was crazy. That was, that was crazy. bonkers. Such ridicule by those who would never, ever think of taking such risks. They call the event bonkers and crazy dog whistles meant to bring up Kanye's mental state. Sorry, Steph, if you used mental illness as a disqualifying factor to express opinion, you'd have no guests on your network. So after today, expect a pile on. SNL will do a skit that will be much less entertaining than the real thing. And the mean girls at CNN will call him names like they did last night. And he's an attention whore like the president. He's all of a sudden now the, the, the model spokesperson. He's, he's the token Negro of the, of the Trump administration. Here's some advice. You know when you're on TV giving a hot take in front of a dwindling audience? I'd hold off on the accusations of attention seeking. Mm -hmm. But West can handle it. None of this bothers him because he's on a mission. And the risk he's taking, extending an olive branch to someone that the media demands he should condemn lifts him above and beyond the abysmal groupthink of the entertainment world, especially when he does this. But I love this guy right here. Let me give this guy a hug right here. I love this guy right here. That's really nice. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Yeah. That's really nice. Jim, Kanye, I appreciate it. So let's go have some lunch. Let's go have some lunch. Why bother? You just ate the Democrats. <laughs> hey, uh, Jesse, we were talking about this. There's something actually very powerful uh, it was just a power. I found it to be very powerful. Yeah, and maybe, I, I don't know. What it was a very special moment. Just think about the raw talent in that room. Jim Brown, one of the greatest running backs ever. Kanye West, one of the most talented artists of all time. And Donald Trump, talented politician and businessman, all sitting together. And it was a real special moment. You played a really important soundbite. And it was the soundbite where Kanye said this. Because China has stolen all of our factory jobs from the inner cities and from the core of America, it's gotten to the point where young black Americans are now taking risks and doing illegal things to feed their family because they don't have access to good jobs on the streets anymore, and they're getting put in jail. And if you can solve that problem, and if you can get on, if you can get black America buy-in to the America First agenda, to the Made in America agenda, to the trade agenda, to the energy agenda, that's going to have a huge impact on this country where you have people coming together of all stripes, of all stripes and fighting for a nationalistic, patriotic, economic agenda for this country. It's really special. And the media 
already framing it as negative. They're saying this was an angry rant. Mm -hmm. When Taylor Swift or Katy Perry, they do these things, they're, they, they're called, you know, expressions, uh, uh, soulful expressions, passionate. passionate. <laughs> uh, you know, you don't hear that. So you got to really keep in mind that the media is trying to trick your mind. And I, I just thought everybody needs to watch the raw of this footage because it, it was even more than you played. It was, it was really eye-opening. Yeah. You, Juan, there was a moment in there which I think you would have admired, which is he went in there and, uh, and he complimented Donald Trump and then he slipped in what he, what he believed was important, that they had to stop, stop, they have to stop, stop and frisk in Chicago because it's destructive. And the look on uh, Trump's face was like, okay. And it was like, so, so he actually, he's getting, I mean, you can laugh at him, you can love him, you can hate him, but he's actually got a concession, I believe, out of Trump just by doing that. I was going to ask you what concession. So you, was, think, was, you think that Trump now is going to back off of the stop and frisk? I think that tr w w Trump has gotten so much out of this, and I think there is a genuine affection between these two men that he will probably get something out of, in exchange for something else. Oh, okay, but I didn't see any major concession on the table because I didn't see any substance. Instead, what I see is a celebrity, uh, and by the way, I don't understand, I mean, I think that the Oval Office should be treated with some respect, and the idea he goes in there and is using such awful language. I don't think that's very cool. Was but Bill Clinton respectful? Oh, in that let me just say, oh, let on. me just say, this is what we heard from Republicans, but now with this, oh, it's okay. But the, here's the thing about this guy. I just don't understand why it is that, you know, people would think this is about the black community. To the contrary, this is Trump I think speaking to his white backers and saying, I'm not a racist. Oh, come on. Oh, here's this guy. Here's Kanye he West, he's here with me, so the, hey, the all, these, all, this, make a change, all these things about me calling people dogs and coming from s-hole countries and my, don't worry about it, what? here's Kanye, but, but then you're Kanye saying a white is person can used. never change, yeah, Kanye, right. white person can Kanye never sought change. him what? out, Trump didn't that's what ask you're saying, no, I'm not. if a white person is actually having a conversation with a black leader, your reasoning will be it's person. always to appease no, white racists. No, Greg, come on, this, this behavior by Trump didn't start yesterday. It started, remember, he had black people coming in, like Jim Brown, like Steve Harvey, remember right. this? Yeah. Uh, and Kanye West, right over there, Trump Tower. Yes. When after, and again, what came out of it? Zero. Nope. So this is this. the point. Oh, this is, this is the... This, this is, is what, called progress. No, this is progress in terms of Trump signing to say, you know what, forget Charlotte, forget all the things that no, I've done. come on. Oh, I have okay. a black friend, Kanye West. If all Kanye right. wanted to go to the White House and talk to Trump and Trump said no, he would be labeled racist. If, if Kanye wants to go to the White House and talk to Trump, oh he gets labeled God. racist. This, this, this guy Believe can't it. win. He you is have a to prop. Give, you have to give Kanye credit. I don't always agree with him. him Sometimes I don't understand what he's saying, to be perfectly frank. But he goes in, he speaks his mind, and he knows Kanye West knows that he's going to be abused by everybody in Hollywood, everybody in his little bubble out there. They're going to make fun of him. They're going to berate him, and he doesn't care. And frankly, that is inspirational, because in this time, we should be telling everybody, if you have something to say, if you want to go and talk to the president of the United States and have the opportunity to do that, even if you don't agree with him on anything, and you can put policy issues on the table, whether it's stop and frisk or whatever it is, and you can bring, look, we're talking about stop and frisk. That's an accomplishment because now everybody's talking about it. Let me just so say quickly, that that that. I don't think that when you have this guy standing up there and saying, oh, let's do away with the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery in this country, you say, hmm, I think something's yeah, wrong. There was, yeah, no, there was some substance behind that that we, we can't touch on, Dana, but um, <laughs> I do think that what you are seeing is somebody who's willing to sacrifice his uh, his cool credentials because he believes in it. And the Even message Kanye. was, yeah, and the yeah. message is not a single negative message in there. Well, it can be. But when, when you're in a position where you have the freedom and the financial security to be able to, like, take a risk and do what you want, and you could be a leader in a different way, right? So I'd also think that everyone needs to just sleep on this. Wake up in the morning and listen to other people. I mean, Juan feels passionately about it, and I'm sure a lot of people around the country do. And let me, can I go back to stop and frisk for just a moment? Yeah. Yesterday, President Trump was at the International Association of Chiefs of Police in Florida, get, or two days ago. Give, uh, he loves the police. He, mm -hmm. he supports the police. He says it's only administration who's been behind you, all that kind of hyperbole. But part of that is trusting the police to do something. Mm -hmm. Kanye West comes in, I don't like stop and frisk. And the friend's like, okay, you know what? Maybe then the president, because he has the power of convening, 
mm -hmm. bring the two together right. because what's really important is to be able to have the two sides talk. But stop and frisk is not going to stop yeah. because police think that is effective unless you have a situation where the, it goes to court. The other now I mentioned this about three weeks ago that Colin Kaepernick should go to the White House and meet with Trump, mm -hmm. and that was the other thing that that uh, Kanye mm -hmm. West said that like his goal is to bring Kaepernick and Trump together, convening. Right. right, and the other thing I did think, if I could just say from just a perspective, is the this White House is very television savvy. Yeah, but one, sometimes they set up shots that are, do not work for them, right? But and this one's interesting. President Trump's behind the desk. Yeah. Usually when he has a meeting with somebody in the Oval Office, he's with uh, a world leader or somebody in their city, or like Nikki Haley, she yeah. was in the mm -hmm. two chairs over there. The president knew this wasn't the exact, he didn't <laughs> elevate Kanye West to that level, right? He's like, I'm gonna sit behind the desk, we're gonna have a meeting, oh, and the true. shot, the way that it's set up, the only people that are really in the shot, you can see President Trump a little bit, the profile of Kanye West, and all the media. Yeah. Right. It was actually very interesting to watch it with the sound off. Yeah. As I did when I was getting hair and makeup done initially. Because <laughs> then you're there, you could just see them going, wow, this is the most crazy thing I've ever seen. Yeah, but not yeah. crazy in a bad way, but just like, it's different. And I'll, if I could just add one last thing. We are in a time of extraordinary economic prosperity. Mm -hmm. This is a time when you can solve problems like the ones that they're talking mm -hmm. about. This is where you convene people to be able to talk about this. We're not at, we're not at each other's throats for certain things. Yes. You, when you have peace, and you have prosperity, you can deal with these things. Might I quote Scott Adams? Please. He said, it, we don't have a money problem, we have an ideas problem. Yeah. Mm. All right. I had to do he that said, once He a said show. it better than I did. <laughs> yes. But drink. There yes. it is. <laughs> Everybody gets a drink when I say Scott Adams. If you're fed up with political correctness, you may not be alone. Details ahead.
If you're sick and tired of political correctness and think it's gone way too far, there's good news. You are not alone. A new study finds a whopping 80% of Americans think PC culture is a problem. Researchers say people of all races and ages, including young people, dislike it. Now, Dana, this was a little bit surprising to me. Now, not the 80%, but when you look at the polling on young people, 74% of people ages 24 to 29 and 79% under 24 also don't like it. Did that surprise well, you? Uh, well, I was relieved because I thought they might save us. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. they, they, they've grown up watching all of this saying, I can't stand it, and being so nervous about what I can say, what I can't say, and tiptoeing around. Right. The other number that surprised, didn't surprise me, but it's 8% of Americans are progressive activists. Do you know how much time we devote to talking about these progressive activists? And they <laughs> cause a lot of trouble. Not enough. And they're only 8%. Yeah, and the other thing that was interesting also is that it, you know it, it spanned every race. 82% yes. of Asians, 87% of Hispanics, 88% of American Indians, 75% of African Americans. Is that that to me was also surprising because I thought there would be more of a, dis a disparity potential. Well, you know the interesting thing is. Uh the politically correct movement wasn't all that bad at the beginning it, because it, it, it initially it was to convince people not to use slurs. <laughs> don't be, right. don't, don't say terrible things. But when they, when they shifted into fashioning language as a violation of laws, whether it be on campus or, or hate, you know, hate crimes or the, if you use the wrong pronoun, you could be in trouble. What's the P PC movement? which started focusing on language to reshape society, they're now on the wrong side of the First Amendment because the logical extension of deem deeming language evil is that you shut down discourse on campus and you mm -hmm. target people for jokes and you hound people for wearing a red hat. That's the logical extension of, I hate to use the phrase weaponizing, but weaponizing <laughs> language you don't agree with. It's not, it's PC culture is now a bacteria. I always thought, Jesse, this was one of the main reasons that Trump won, was the disgust that the vast majority of people have with politicians that don't actually say what they're thinking. And then you had this guy show up. He's, he's not politically correct. He sounds like someone who's actually being direct and honest with them. And it looks like, based on this, a lot of people, maybe that is why he won. Yeah, as someone that's lived and died <laughs> in the politically incorrect world, this is a fascinating study. All, all of the minority groups in this country, vast majorities of them believe political correctness is a problem. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think it's the vocal minority in the media right. yes. that makes that's right. people... Lose it's, their jobs your, what your when they percentage. say something controversial 80%. or politically incorrect, and it's it's an eye-opening study. And uh, I just uh, you and know printed in the Atlantic. What a, yep. it's Waters World. There it was. <laughs> Bye. Juan, what do you, me the same. What do you think? What do you make of oh, this? Oh, look, I, I wrote a book about political correct. I've been fired for people who think I'm not politically correct. Hell, I work at Fox. So, <laughs> so but the thing about it is, and I, this comes back to something I said earlier. There's a small percentage of people at the fringes. The vast majority of people are in the middle, and they don't want intolerant, hateful language, like about immigrants that we comes from, guess who? Uh, they don't like it. But they think that they should be able to express themselves freely without being condemned. And I'm all for that. But intolerant language from the provocateurs who make money by saying ugly things, I think those people mm. need to get, the, get out of here. Mm, Watch right. your mouth, Juan. <laughs> One more thing's coming up next. We'll be right